Hello, BookTube. Welcome back to Middlemarch Meditations. We're going to put in a couple of additional pages today, if that's all right. Normally we do three, don't we? It takes us about half an hour. But if I did that, we would just have a page and a half left of chapter three. And I felt that there was a natural break in the story at the end of that chapter. So I thought I'm just going to extend this a little more. Might be a slightly longer video, but we'll get to the end of chapter three. As I load the book pages, watch out for words and phrases that I've underlined in green because what I'm looking for there, I'm, I'm picking out all the language that's related to eyesight, seeing, or visible aspects of beauty the, to go along with, you know, you saw the thumbnail there, which I'll talk about in a minute, but also the, the title of this was rather short-sighted, wasn't it? And so I think this section of chapter three is playing on this idea of, of seeing what there is to see, what people can make themselves unwilling to see. And un, or possibly unable to see, but we'll debate that. We'll definitely debate that. We're starting now on page 29. Perhaps I should comment on the canine nature of the background photo. Obviously, there was a little dog in the thumbnail, and there's dogs here. Dogs going to feature. Got some interesting dog material to share. So if there are dog lovers watching, this is your video. This is your video, definitely. Let's get page 29 up, though, and go back to where we left off the last meditation. We were at the point where uh, this paragraph begins. Dorothea checked herself suddenly. And the reason she's checking herself, she's been lost in sort of fantastical thought. Let's make this bigger. About what married life with Mr. Casalban will be like. And getting herself wildly carried away with just how deliriously happy she's going to be. And so it's kind of good that she's being checked because those thoughts, even she was thinking those thoughts were going perhaps a little bit too far. But she was interrupted. And I'm just going to read here because this is just a splendid passage. So Dorothea checked herself suddenly with self-rebuke for the presumptuous way in which she was reckoning on uncertain events. But she was spared any inward effort to change the direction of her thoughts by the appearance of a cantering horseman round the turning of the road. The well-groomed chestnut horse and two beautiful setters could leave no doubt that the rider was Sir James Chetham. He discerned Dorothea, jumped off his horse at once, and, having delivered it to his groom, advanced towards her with something white on his arm, at which the two setters were barking in an excited manner. "'How delightful to meet you, Miss Brooke,' he said, raising his hat and showing his sleekly waving blonde hair. "'It has hastened the pleasure I was looking forward to.' I read that and I thought, do you know, if George Eliot had had an inclination and and extra time to write more than her serious novel, then it would have to be in addition to her serious novels. I can never imagine George Eliot um, just writing light and fluffy stuff. But this, this could be coming straight out of a Harlequin romance or a Mills and Boone. It really could, or some kind of period romance. It's just... A, as a hero, Sir James Chetham is just delicious. Uh, if you're attracted to men, even if you don't want to marry him, you think, yeah, but I'm going, I'm going to have a look at him because he's a rather impressive human being. Definitely so. And uh, this is just literally, you could just take those two paragraphs, pull them out of Middlemarch, plant them in a Mills and Boone or a Harlequin romance. And anyone who has never read Middlemarch or knew nothing of George Eliot wouldn't twig that this was coming, except that they would think, oh, you know, these sentences are quite well constructed. <laughs> I think they noticed that. I think they noticed that in the vocabulary. But this is just pure uh, romance, the kind of novels that George Eliot was a little bit scathing about, was it? Was she not? Somebody, um, Joseph Francis Burton, I bet you've read her essays on silly women novelists. And yet I think, I think she's read a lot of those, Do you know, just, just, theorizing. I think she's read a lot of those, and I think she can imitate them quite well. So let's go on now. I'm going to take page 29 off and put up page 30, which just begins so strangely because it begins after all this exhibition of the most incredible male beauty. Uh, Miss Brooke was annoyed. <laughs> oh, and I think I should bring in Nina Auerbach. Now, if you don't know, Nina was the John Welsh Centennial Professor of English at the University of Pennsylvania until she retired. She's in her 80s now. Uh, she has this irreverent but refreshing view of Middlemarch because she wrote a lot 
about Eliot's books. And, and she wrote an article, which will be in the description box. You'll find the link there. The article's titled Dorothea's Lost Dog. And in it, Nina writes, quote, Dorothea Brooke has always irritated me. In fact, she makes my flesh creep. And with that, let's carry on and read this scene. It says, Miss Brooke was annoyed at the interruption. <laughs> this amiable baronet, yeah, who's rather handsome as well and extremely rich, uh, apparently a really suitable husband for Celia, exaggerated the necessity of making himself agreeable to the elder sister. Even a prospective brother-in-law may be an oppression if he will always be presupposing too good an understanding with you and agreeing with you even when you contradict him. The thought that he had made the mistake of paying his address to herself could not take shape. All her mental activity was used up in persuasions of another kind. Well, I'm really sorry. I will admit, at this point in Chapter 3, this is where, if I could have walked into the book, I would have either slapped Dorothea or just given her a good shouting. <laughs> that, that sentence just infuriated me. I don't buy that she doesn't get what's going on. I think, I'm really sorry, how stupid are you? <laughs> And she isn't stupid, though. We already know she has the capacity for complex thinking. She loves academic books and so on. And and Sir James, you know, he's not a subtle guy, is he? I mean, he's just doing, he's doing all the things that society says you'd better do if you want to court a wife. You'd, you'd better get out there and you'd better make sure you see her often and you're always pleasant to her. And if possible, you bring her something. And, uh, of course... That's what we're going to go on to. Uh, but before I do, I just want to mention Joseph Francis Burton, another shout out to you. And Marion H., we were discussing, weren't we, I think in the comments for the last meditation, we were talking about, does you know, is it straining credibility now for Eliot or the narrator to still claim that Dorothea has no conception that James is courting her? Isn't, you know, really? <laughs> just and, and I'm not sure... Maybe she is, because she might be being sarcastic in this way, just by pushing this, pushing this to its absolute limit. Any kind of exaggeration is always a bit comic in one way or another. And this seems like a very sharp comedy on her, you know, complete, what, denial? That's the only way I feel I can explain Dorothea's actions, is that subconsciously she can't take in things that, that aren't what she wants. So she she's learned how to shut out the, the kind of thoughts, the kind of connections that everybody else would make. But anyway, uh, <laughs> so of course she has this roused temper that made her color deeply, and she returned his greeting with some haughtiness. <sighs> Honestly. So James interrupted, interrupted, there we go, Heather's, Heather's having a tough Saturday morning. Sir James interpreted <laughs> the heightened color in a way most gratifying to himself. Of course he did. Uh, he's a little bit short-sighted too, when we think about it. He... I, and I think he's probably always been a man who's been accepted and had his wishes accepted. And he's probably not used to rejection. He's probably not used to the idea of not being very attractive to other people. So, of course, he's just he's he's got a sight problem as well. He sees the heightened color and and all he thinks of is how handsome she is. And this is, you know, what a fantastic thing that he's he's caught her at this point. And so let's let's uh, grab the page going to move it up because he says here, I have brought a little petitioner, he said, or rather I have brought him to see if he will be approved before his petition is offered. He showed the white object under his arm, which was a tiny Maltese puppy, one of nature's most naive toys. And and that's uh, that's lovely. I'm going to keep on reading though because this this just gets quite in fact, the next line, Dorothea says, it is painful to me. Well, I tell you what, this is a painful thing to read. It is painful to me to see these creatures that are bred merely as pets, said Dorothea, whose opinion was forming itself that very moment. Yeah, as opinions will. That is to say, the opinions of people that think you don't need to think through your opinions before you start saying them. That's the kind of people that do that. So now we know, under the heat of irritation, yeah, exactly, bad time to be forming any opinion. So, of course, Sir James says, oh, why, said Sir James, as they walked forward, and she says, I believe all the petting that is given them does not make them happy. They are too helpless. Their lives are too frail. And she goes on to talk about how she just, these creatures are parasitic. I thought, oh, my God, seriously, this little puppy. <laughs> and what does Sir James do? 
amiable guy. He he knows, you know, exactly how to do this, play this game. I am so glad to know that you do not like them, said good Sir James. I should never keep them for myself, but ladies usually are fond of these Maltese dogs. Here, John, take this dog, will you? So in other words, his groom, who's accompanied him, gets the horse, gets the dog, anything that she doesn't want, anything Dorothea doesn't want, hmm, that will move away. And so this po this paragraph, the objectionable puppy, whose nose and eyes were equally black and expressive, in other words, this is a drop-dead gorgeous little dog, was thus got rid of, since Miss Brooke decided that it had better not have been born. Wow. Now, the reason this passage is so painful to read, and, and must have been in a way painful for Eliot to write, is Eliot was crazy about dogs, absolutely crazy about them. Let me diverge, divert, let me divert you. I put forward that Eliot crafted this scene purposely because she wants us to get so angry with Dorothea because Eliot herself was a dog lover. Again, in my description box, you're going to find a link to the Digital Commons website from the University of Nebraska and an essay titled George Eliot, George Henry Lewis and Dogs. <laughs> George Eliot's publisher Blackwood gave her a dog as a gift following the success of Adam Bede, a little pug. Yeah, another little tiny dog bred purely to be petted and loved. Now, this is what was said about that little dog. So, Pug was brought to Putney Station. Pug was the name of the pug, believe it or not. Brought to Putney Station by Joseph Langford, Blackwood's London manager, where he was received by an initially grievously disappointed Lewis, although George Eliot recorded his arrival in her diary with the exclamation, Pug came! Her only entry for the 29th of July, 1859. Both new owners were quickly won over, however, with Lewis reporting to Blackwood that the creature was, quote, transcendent in ugliness, in tyranny over George Eliot, stupid as a beauty, but very gentle and affectionate. The laughter is Homeric and inextinguishable. Excited by his odd looks and ways, George Eliot pets him above petting. Right? So, of course, and, and Blackwood kept getting series of reports in letters about how Pug was doing. Um, George Eliot liked to write herself and describe all his little actions, you know, as only someone who adores their dog can do. So she, she, she's describing Pug about his, uh, his astonishment at the sight of cows and other rural objects, at which he marches up to and surveys with the gravity of an own correspondent whose business is to observe. He has absolutely no bark, but he sneezes powerfully and has speaking eyes. Love that. Speaking eyes. So the media of communication are abundant. He sneezes at the world in general and he looks affectionately at me. So there we go. We know that George Eliot was nothing like Dorothea, right? Someone offers her a little pug. She goes crazy. She loves it. She can't stop talking about every little thing it does, including just how often it sneezes. Right. So the article's worth reading in full, by the way. Please, you know, do have a look at it because it shows that both George Eliot and George Henry Lewis, they were both dog crazy. They absolutely were. They had multiple dogs uh, throughout their life together. So on that basis, I think you can be pretty sure that Eliot wrote this scene, chose this heartbreakingly beautiful Maltese puppy deliberately so that all her readers would be as furious <laughs> with with Dorothea, as she would have been. Can you hear that? <laughs> Next door there is a cattle market, and there have been a lot of dog noises this morning, and I, uh, there must be several dogs out there now who are all howling in sympathy, howling in sympathy for that poor little Maltese puppy. I don't know how they knew. I didn't go out there and coach them. Right on cue. That's fantastic. So, We'll go to the last paragraph of, of this page um, where Dorothea says, you must not judge Celia's feeling from mine. I think she likes these small pets. She had a tiny terrier once, which she was very fond of. It made me unhappy because I was afraid of treading on it. I am rather short-sighted. Well, that's an understatement when it comes to Dorothea Brooke. <laughs> I am ra You are, yeah, in many, many, many ways. Your vision really has its limitations. So that's the end of, of page 30. We'll go on to page 31. The dogs are still having at it, and I guess we'll just have to let them. It's impossible to uh, 
to tell dogs to be quiet if they don't want to be. Right, page 31. Let's um, make this a little bit bigger so that we can read. <laughs> because, of course, Mr. Chatham, of course, he's just so thrilled that Miss Brooke has her opinion about everything. <laughs> okay. Sure. Let's see. But so Sir James, he's short-sighted as well. He can't see beyond this conviction that he's going to have whatever he wants. And it doesn't matter how many of his gifts Dorothea rejects. I mean, she's already turned down a horse and a dog. and uh, and, and But he's not done yet. He still has a, a plan up his sleeve. And of course, she's so, she's so rude. She's so rude to him that even she realizes, amazingly, it breaks through all her denial that she's being rude, where she um, whereas he says, uh, Sir so James says, your power of forming an opinion. I can form an opinion of persons. I know when I like people. But about other matters, do you know, I have often difficulty in deciding. One hears very sensible things said on opposite sides. That's actually a very sensible comment. Yes, if you're trying to research a very complex issue, you can hear sensible things said by both sides of an argument. But, of course, that's not how Dorothea sees it. She says, or that seems sensible. Perhaps we uh, don't always discriminate between sense and nonsense. Well, wow, when she says we, I mean, you might. she's saying you. Perhaps you have a problem. Uh, and, of course, there she says, Dorothea felt she was rather rude. <laughs> she's basic. She's called him an idiot. I put it in the margin. She's just flat out called him an idiot. Uh, but, you know, he he has... A great deal of self-confidence, so that does not trouble him. He says, exactly. <laughs> but you seem to have the power of discrimination, he says. Huh. It's just quite amazing. Now, what's interesting is he's done his homework, though. Because even though he's turned down and she's still not going with him, he's, he's got a secret weapon. He says here, I think there are few who would see it more readily. Do you know? Lovegood was telling me yesterday that you had the best notion in the world of a plan for cottages. Quite wonderful for a young lady, he thought. You had a real genus, to use his expression. He said you wanted Mr. Brooke to build a new set of cottages. But he seemed to think it hardly possible that your uncle would consent. Do you know? That is one of the things I wish to do. Of course, of course, of course you do. The horse got turned down. The puppy got turned down. Now he's trying. What about the cottage? Can I give you some cottages? Well, he's done it. He's done it. He's picked the right thing at last. Uh, and so I'm going to I'm going to pop down to the bottom because, yes, she gets very excited, of course, forgetting all her previous small vexations. See, that's how blind she is, right? All you have to do with Dorothea is just start talking about something she wants. And she, again, all, none of her emotions have anything to do with you. They all have to do with her. Am I hearing what I want? Am I getting what I want? Is 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 life about what I want? If it is, I'm happy. If it isn't, I'm unhappy. doesn't matter who's around me. doesn't matter how pleasant they're being. That's irrelevant. I don't react to other people. I react to my own wishes being met or not met. So she goes on and talks about how important it is to build houses for the poor. This is a very unfocused photograph. Good heavens, I need to work on better photographs when I give you pages. Well, never mind, this is ending soon. I'm just going down to the bottom because Dorothea mentions somebody. Again, there's a lot of name dropping in Middlemarch as we've, as we've come to expect. Yes, certainly. I dare say it is very faulty, but I have been examining all the plans for cottages in Luden's book. Now that, you know, and I've noted here, John Claudius Luden, born 1833, who wrote an encyclopedia for cottages, farms, and villa architecture, and I have a cover graphic. This is the inside cover of that encyclopedia. So I, I presume her uncle had a volume of it in his fantastic library, and she's paged through it, looked at the plans, and drawn up some concepts of her own, which is admirable. It's not, you know, there are things about Dorothy that's admirable. She's obviously a little, she would be an intellectual powerhouse if she were given correct education and direction so that her energies went into a career, but that's that's not here. She doesn't have that. So where her energies tend to go, it's sort of admirable and yet you think what's gonna what's gonna come of that, unfortunately. So we'll take Luden off now and we're gonna also take page thirty one off because we're just now going to go to the top of page thirty two, where Dorothea mentions, she says, I think instead of Lazarus at the gate, we should put the pigsty cottages outside the park gate. Now, 
I, I shouldn't make an assumption here that everybody is physically literate. Sorry for that noise. That's the desk that this laptop is sitting on. I shouldn't assume biblical literacy. If, if you're thinking, if Lazarus at the gate means nothing to you, and you're thinking, what? <laughs> What's she talking about? Let's, um, let's go to, it's from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16. So anybody who does know the Gospel of Luke really well, if this is like, oh my goodness, Sunday school, I got this over and over again. That's cool. You can tune out, but this is for those who, for whom, you know, the New Testament might be something that, that they didn't get exposure to. So, there was a rich man who dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered in sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell, where the rich man was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to here. And the rich man answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus, to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, the rich man said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, then they will repent. But Abraham said, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. So that's the parable. So Lazarus at the gate, when she says, instead of Lazarus at the gate, in other words, instead of poor people having to hang around hoping for small amounts of charity, she says we should put the pigsty cottages. That is, her uncle had cottages on his land for his workers, but that they were not in good shape. And she's saying those should go out. Uh, we shouldn't have people waiting for something good to live in. There should be cottages for them, nice dwellings. Uh, for them to live in. So, you know, again, she has good intentions and uh, in a different environment, in a different time, Dorothea, we'd probably cope with her better. If marriage wasn't the only way that she could see herself having a future, if it was the only outlet, the only option in her life, if, if there was something broader, I think we would tolerate her better. But when she's constrained and constricted, it had, the circumstances have turned her into someone very unpleasant someone that you really think, oh, you know, <laughs> absolutely irritated with. And in some ways, she is being very unkind and, and probably some of the things that she thinks will do good will do the exact opposite of good. So anyway, but of course, she doesn't know that. Dorothea was in her best temper now. Sir James, as brother-in-law, oh yeah, get that in there. You know, Dorothea, don't want us to think that maybe you've twigged, building model cottages on his estate and then perhaps others being built at Lowick. Now, Lowick, of course, is Mr. Casalvin's property, so she's making an assumption there. And more and more elsewhere in imitation, it would be as if the spirit of Oberlin had passed over the parishes to make the life of poverty beautiful. Well, I should have underlined that in green. Since when can you make the life of poverty beautiful? You can give someone a cottage and granted that will be slightly less miserable poverty. But at the end of the day, God bless her. Poverty feels like poverty. If the cottage is a bit better, well, great, you know, but it uh, doesn't really, doesn't make, nothing makes poverty beautiful unless you are very, very blind. And of course, that's that short sight and it's coming in again. Let's just stop and go back to the spirit of Oberlin that she mentions. That is, amazingly, that's not a 17th century person because, you know, Eliot has been uh, covering, filling this book with 17th century references. Johann Friedrich Oberlin was born, I believe in, let me just check my notes, everyone. Uh, 
He was born in 1740 and he served as a pastor in the southeast of France, close to its borders with Germany and Switzerland. Now, he's said to have done some amazing things to improve the lives of the poor people who were in his parish, including improvement to their farming methods, constructing schools that their children could attend, constructing a library they could use, repairing their roads. He, he does seem to be one of those rare people who actually live their faith and anybody would admire them. Uh, and I've added a link to a site with a more detailed biography if you are interested. Now, Celia comes back into the action now because Sir James, of course, he's seeing that finally, finally, he's hit on the thing that makes Miss Brooke much, much happier with him. So they get together and they start looking at these plans and in the middle here of page 32, we can see that Celia was present while the plans were being examined. Oh, and observed Sir James' illusion. Notice she doesn't say that she's observing Dorothea's illusion because maybe she doesn't believe that Dorothea is deluded. Who knows? And she says, he thinks that Dodo cares about him and she only cares about her plans. Yet I am not certain that she would refuse him if she thought he would let her manage everything and carry out all her notions and how very uncomfortable Sir James would be. I cannot bear notions. And then it goes on to, now we learn a little bit more about Celia. It was Celia's private luxury to indulge in this dislike. That's interesting how she sees it that way, as if like, her emotions are luxuries. She's not allowed to have them, but, you know, provided she can do something in a way that doesn't, you know, become unacceptable. She's allowed a little luxury. She dared not confess it to her sister in any direct statement. So here we switch from um, language about seeing to language about hearing because Celia can see things. We we know now Celia Celia's sight is much better than either Dorothea's or Sir James, but she has an interesting issue with what she hears. So let's read this paragraph because it's quite interesting. It was Celia's private luxury to indulge in this dislike. She dared not confess it to her sister in any direct statement, for that would be laying herself open to a demonstration that she was somehow or other at war with all goodness, because, of course, Dorothea would think herself representing goodness. But on safe opportunities, uh -huh, she had an indirect mode of making her negative wisdom tell upon Dorothea and calling her down from her rhapsodic mood by reminding her this is priceless, that people were staring, not listening. Ooh, ow. Gosh. <laughs> she knows how to do it. She knows, gosh, she knows the, the best way to put people down. Celia was not impulsive. What she had to say could wait and came from her always with the same quiet staccato evenness. Mm. When people talked with energy and emphasis, she watched their faces and features merely. In other words, she only listened to what people were saying if they delivered it correctly. That's so interesting. She never could understand how well-bred persons consented to sing and open their mouths in the ridiculous manner. I'm doing it now, remembering singing lessons from long, long ago. You know how you had to really open your mouth to make all those sounds. Uh, and, and it obviously upsets her greatly to see people contorting their, you know, your facial features should hardly move. So I can imagine Celia, whenever she speaks, her face would probably stay very, very still and you wouldn't get eyebrow movement or any wrinkles appearing that that's great she'll she'll prevent wrinkles for a long time won't she <laughs> utterly expressionless communication but th this is the thing for her what she hears so she has a selective sort of deafness if you can be short hearing as opposed to short sighted it doesn't doesn't quite work does it that translation but it's the same sort of thing she has selective hearing dorothea has selective sight ah uh, bless so Let's go on, because we, we see it mentioned now at the bottom of the page that uh, Mr. Casalban is making another visit. And by making these additional visits, it's becoming clear to Dorothea that well, what she was suspecting, that he was interested in her, is the case. Is the case. So, of course, that's scary. We will go on to page 33, where her excitement just starts getting crazy again, exactly as the way it did where we left off with the last meditation. So she just starts getting weird about him. And, and I'm just going to start reading here from um, the, the second line. And this trust in his mental wealth 
was all the deeper and more effective on her inclination because it was now obvious that his visits were made for her sake. This accomplished man condescended to think of a young girl. I thought, yeah, well, it's condescension. <laughs> you will know that soon. And take the pains to talk to her, yeah, and it will become painful later on. Not with absurd compliment, but with an appeal to her understanding, and sometimes with instructive correction. Well, how delightful. Uh, what, and as she, uh, she uses that word, what delightful companionship. Again, this is just dripping irony, this. Mr. Casalban seemed even unconscious that trivialities existed, and never handed round the small talk of heavy men, which is as acceptable as stale bride cake brought forth with an odor of cupboard. <laughs> nice metaphor. He talked of what he was interested in or else he was silent. So he and Dorothy are just, they're cut from the same cloth. If it doesn't interest them, you know, it doesn't matter who the person is. It doesn't matter what they're saying. It, if it doesn't interest them, too bad. It can be the most worthy subject on earth. It could be urgent. No, no. And, yeah. And to, to, to Dorothea, this was adorable genuineness. Well, it's going to become something else very, very soon. <laughs> oh, and of course, she just goes on in this in this vein. She looked reverently at Mr. Casalban's religious elevation above herself, and you just this gets really quite sickly. Um, it becomes one of those things that you think, oh my God! Uh, except, of course, on one. Here we go. On one, only one of her favorite themes, she was disappointed. <laughs> Mr. Casalban apparently did not care about building cottages and diverted the talk to the extremely narrow accommodation which was to be had in the dwellings of the ancient Egyptians, the dead ancient Egyptians, who might say, long dead. What modern Egyptians were living in, I doubt Mr. Casalban has any conception. <sighs> Never mind, okay? Even I'm getting started to get... I was in, here's, now I want to walk into the book and start shouting all over again, right, for a different reason. But she's just so... This just shows blindness again. Dorothea is, is proving that saying that we have that love is blind. She's just so astoundingly blind to what his personal characteristics will really be like to live with. She's translating them, mutating them, repainting them, trying to decorate them up as being something so much more exciting. And the dogs are telling me we haven't talked enough about dogs in this video. But, you know, maybe we'll come back to that. <laughs> we might have to. They might insist. Oh, but anyway, she's just going on and on in this vein. I, I don't really feel like you know going too much into this. I tried looking up what ancient, what sort of accommodation ancient Egyptians did live in really couldn't find anything that would be helpful so and and at any rate would it be helpful they lived in narrow accommodation so what so what but anyway she just she can't even bring herself to realize that she might have an issue here the only way she comforts herself is by thinking that it was presumptuous to demand his attention to such a subject he would not disapprove of her occupying herself with it in leisure moments as other women expected to occupy themselves with their dress and embroidery and would not forbid it she's absolutely certain would not forbid it huh interesting even though i don't know where she thinks she's going to get the money for <laughs> building these cottages uh, even the money that she might be given as a dowry will not necessarily be easy for her to use as she wishes um women women can you know even the money that they had of their own it wasn't always that easy for them to claim ownership of it. But there we go. Her uncle had been invited to go to Lowick to stay a couple of days. And of course, <laughs> the, the narrator says, was it reasonable to suppose that Mr. Casalban delighted in Mr. Brooks' society for its own sake? Uh, no, it probably wasn't um, reasonable to suppose that. It was more reasonable to suppose something else. And so that takes us on nicely to page 34. So anyway, here we go. We've still got Mr. Sir James Chetham showing up. He came more often than Mr. Casalban. That's really, this is sort of, this makes me sad because he's making such an incredible effort. And Dorothea ceased to find him disagreeable. Why? Because he showed himself so entirely in earnest. And of course, he was doing exactly what she wanted. She was getting these estimates for the, the cottages and he was charmingly docile and she proposed to build a couple of them and transfer two families. And all Sir James said was, exactly, oh my God, she's just doing whatever she 
wants. What she doesn't know is even if she married Sir James, that wouldn't necessarily last. That that incredible plasticity and willingness and docility is that is all with the aim of getting her as a wife. <laughs> you know, he might please her after that. He does seem like a, a kind of agreeable fellow. One hopes that he isn't one of those who turns, you know, and becomes a completely opposite personality. We shall see. Maybe maybe Middlemarch will tell us later. So uh, what did I drop down to? Of course, here we go with uh, Dorothea thinking again. Certainly these men who had so few spontaneous ideas might be very useful members of society under good feminine direction if they were fortunate in choosing their sisters-in-law. Now, here we go. Here's where the narrator, uh, Joseph and Marion, starts to agree with us, I think. It is difficult to say. It is just difficult. Uh, difficult to say whether there was or was not a little willfulness in her continuing blind. I didn't color that green, but I should have done. Continuing blind to the possibility that another sort of choice was in question in relation to her. Well, I tell you what, it's it's just, it's just so difficult to accept that there wasn't some willfulness. Uh, it might be subconscious. You know, we don't always realize that we're pushing something out of our awareness. But if it were pointed out to her, I, I, which I get the feeling it's going to be, it's going to disturb Dorothea's lovely, you know, well-constructed, everybody's doing what I want, everything's going my way kind of world. And it, oh, one last sort of horrible sign of blindness was how she was getting down learned books from the library and reading many things hastily that she might be a little less ignorant in talking to Mr. Casalban. And isn't that just what, what, what people do when they don't realize they've got the wrong kind of relationship? If you have to run around doing something, either something to the degree that you would not do, because of course she would read books. We know that she would read books, but the degree to which she's having to do that, all this tearing around, doing something unnatural just to make another person happy. I mean, that's what Sir James Chetham is doing to get her attentions, but she's also running around doing it, trying to get Mr. Casalbans. I think Elliot's making a comment about love. Why do we do this? Why, why in our desperate, desperate, desperate hunt for someone to be with, we, we twist ourselves out of the person that we are into someone slightly different, just so that we can attract a person who will turn out not to be enough like us where we actually have to live with them. It's, it's a, oh, it, it's a terrible conundrum terrible conundrum and she doesn't really comment on it directly but you 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 think here we go here's this sad situation is going to happen again someone's going to tie themselves up like a pretzel to make somebody else happy only to realize that just does not work you don't make yourself or that person happy unless you are you know unless you can just be yourself with someone else and not have to make you know a huge amount of changes that person probably isn't the right person to get started with it probably isn't so yeah I'm just thinking, and of course, there's this lovely foreboding sentence that it ends on, all the while being visited with conscientious questionings whether she were not exalting these poor doings above measure and contemplating them with that self-satisfaction which was the last doom of ignorance and folly. Good place to end there. Right, everybody, really enjoyed this meditation with you. We are now up to chapter four. I am in reading two books. I'm reading Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye on my Kindle, but also I've been given a book, a very unusual book, because I don't know when I finish it whether to review it as fiction or nonfiction. I'm going to leave you with that little mystery. Okay, everybody, thanks so much for tuning in. Look forward to seeing you all again soon. Take care. Bye-bye.